All right, so uh, starting lecture 11 today, uh, the computer vision course. Um, okay, so the references for um, for deep learning and CNN stay the same. Uh, however, for today's uh, lecture, I'm adding a few more references. These are more of like uh, publications and uh, surveys that you can find uh, on the web. Uh, specifically looked at this one, a uh, little bit of this one, a uh, little bit of this one, and also this one. So you can see mainly this one and this one for today. Uh, so you can take a look at these references as well. Okay, so today we'll do a recap of uh, CNN, Convolutional Neural Networks, and we'll also look at some uh, CNN architectures and their evolution across the last decade or so. Um, so it's been more than a decade. Yeah. So the popular ones, uh, it's been a decade. Um, all right. So CNN, we spoke about CNN in terms of functionality and also, you know, how the layers show up. So in terms of functionality, what is CNN essentially doing? You kind of, um, in, in the earlier days, we used to do feature extraction on our own. Now we just pass in an image and then let CNN do the feature extraction. So all the earlier layers with convolutions and pooling is essentially look uh, extracting more and more refined features, which can then be used into a classification model. So previously think of your classification model as only this. So this is traditional. Classification, right? So we say classification, okay, do this. But then to do this, you need good features. Which you need to either do feature engineering or you need to use a pre trained model. So here we are kind of doing that pre trained model. This is your model, right? So this is all in one. You're doing the training for, for getting good features, but also using it in classification all in all in one. So you don't you're not separating it out. Previously you'd separate it out. Um, you know, so here uh, it turns out uh, CNNs that are trained well with good architectures can find good features on their own. So why bother you know doing feature engineering on your own when you can do that for images, right? Um, and then once you have this, uh, once you go through this classification layer, you output probabilities for different classes. Um, and yeah, so that's the breakdown of the functionality. Um, and in terms of layers, yeah, you have convolution plus nonlinearity and then max pooling. So this is actually capturing the refined features. Convolutions are good for images, so that's why we use convolution. And we know we can do different things on images through different convolutions and you get different results. So we've looked at that in the past. And so convolution is a good idea to extract features from images. You just let the CNN decide what convolution it's going to use. It'll, it'll figure out itself. And max pooling is mostly just to um, reduce the number of parameters. So that was the reason to use max pooling. People have also experimented not using max pooling, like let's say, uh, these layers don't occupy a lot of parameters, but this layer act does, right? So we know that as soon as you go to a fully connected layer, the number of parameters explode. Even if you had like 20 layers here, but only one layer here, this one layer is actually going to contribute to the most number of parameters. So people have said, well, even max pooling, is it really needed? Like you're saying that it's to reduce the number of parameters, but the number of parameters are high here in this area. So and people have experimented with that and said, okay, you can actually get away with not having max pooling as well. So that's been the more recent trend. But um, in the beginning, people have been using max pooling for that reason. Um, and it's more of an experiment you try as well and see if it helps you. And, uh, and the combination of convolution and max pooling has helped in the past. Okay. Then you have fully connected dense layers and then you have uh, classification at the very end. Okay, and we also looked at the types of layers in CNN, a fully connected layer, um, 
This is like bread and butter of neural networks. Uh, almost every neural network has a fully connected layer somewhere doing something. Um, and then a convolution layer, we have looked at this. We also call this uh, locally connected layer, right? Because an output neuron is only locally connected to the input. It's not fully connected, right? Because you only look at a certain part of the image for a certain output neuron, right? So we've seen that. So if you have, uh, this is your input block, and this is your output block. So then if you're looking at something in this region, like let's say here, and you look at output neuron here, this depends on only this thing here, right? A small region somewhere in the middle. So that's why this is locally connected because this is a local connection. Whereas in fully connected, everything's connected, everything. So um, con layers is locally connected. And um, there's a convolution that happens uh, to get that. And we also spoke about how this is done. Um, so we'll also recap that. Then you have the pooling layer. Pooling layer is also locally connected, right? This is also locally connected. Because when you pool, uh, you again have a field size, a receptive field size, and you only use that field size to do the pooling and then get the output. Uh, and pooling is mostly to reduce the number of neurons from one layer to the other. And then ReLU activation, we spoke about this is standard. We see this in neural network. It, ha it adds a nonlinear touch to convolutions. Um, and it is, it is necessary because it makes the model nonlinear. So think of these ReLU. ReLUs are very simple. They're just like, okay, if you're negative, set it to zero. If you're positive, leave it as it is, right? So uh, they seem really, really innocent. Like, what is it really doing? Well, it's it's actually bringing nonlinearity to the model. And we have seen linear models have limitations. So it's even if you have these complicated, fancy convolutions, but you don't have nonlinearity, it is not adding you know, weight to your CNN. So ReLUs are doing nonlinear, uh, you know, keeping things nonlinear and helping us build complex models. So if you want to go from an image to classification or image to object detection, which we'll go into in the next lecture, or image to a caption, these are all very nonlinear, very complicated things. It seems simple to us, but it's to, to, a, to a model or to a machine, it's not easy, it's not simple so the function is complicated so for that you need nonlinearity, right um, so it's very simple to describe but as actually doing a lot especially when you add relus to every single layer then you know the function becomes pretty can become very complex uh, so you're learning complex functions in this process okay uh, then we have the con layer uh, so we, we, we said that a convolution layer is defined by a convolution kernel and not just one kernel but you have k such kernels and each kernel has parameters uh, parameters w times h times g so you're essentially learning the whole whole kernel right and then you have to learn it for k such kernels um, so the total number of parameters is k times w times h times d yeah so this is your d this is your w this is your h and you have k of these so learn k such blocks so essentially k such filters or kernels and then produce an output block with k, with a depth of k okay so this is the, we said that, this is the output depth. This is the input depth. And we also spoke about how, if you're given a W in the input, how does it change in the output? So we also spoke about that. Um, 
So for that, we have to define some hyperparameters. So K is the depth of the outward block. S is the stride length. Uh, P is the zero padding. And stride length is how much you shift the convolution kernel when passing through the input. Zero padding is how much to pad the input before convolution as it impacts the output size. So if you have F, S, and P, then um, I think a visual here will help. So if you have this, this is your depth, W, this is H, and this is your input. And then you do some convolution here. Uh, let's call it filtering. I think that's better. I think I've used layer in the past lecture, but it might be a little bit confusing because um, this is a, you know, this is the input layer and you're doing something with the layer. So convolution filtering, uh, I think, so maybe that's a better word than layer. And then you get something that's again another layer. And in this case, um, let me actually change the change how it looks like. So maybe you have a higher depth. Okay. All right. So here, um, your depth is K because you're using K filters, right? And here you have something like W O H O. So what is W O? So WO is where we use this formula. So WO is W minus F plus 2P over S plus 1. And HO is H minus F plus 2P over S plus 1. So you take the input width. And then since your you know, receptive field size, your window, you have to subtract that, obviously, uh, because you can only go up to W minus F. But then you're adding zero padding. So you add it twice. Oh, but then you're striding at a, at a, you know, uh, at a space of S, so you divide by S, and then you add one. So that's how you go from W to W0, so WO. So if you know the W and H for the input, this is your WO and HO for the output, and your depth K looks like this. So this is essentially what is happening for any given uh, convolution filter from one input layer to the other, right? Um, so this is your... Okay, so hopefully this makes the picture completely clear. Uh, this is this is essentially ninety percent of CNN is just going from one layer to the other through a convolution, right? And then the rest is like max pooling and fully connected layers. Okay, we also spoke about striding. Uh, you know how here s is equal to one. You stride from uh, because it's, it's the striding is basically the starting point. So here you're here. And then you go to this guy and it starts here. So that's a stride length of one. And then here it's a stride length of two. So how are you parsing the input, right? That's stride length. Uh, we spoke about that. And then we spoke about convolution layer computations. Um, and this is like really important to understand. And we, we went through um, this. Um, essentially, if you want to get the out, the let's say this is depth equals one and depth equals two. So if you're looking at the output volume, uh, output block, and you wanna get, uh, let's say a depth equals two, what is, the, uh, what is the slice looking like? You have to go to the filter, the second filter, because that corresponds to depth equals two, and convolve that filter with the input volume. So you're essentially convolving this whole block with the with the input volume right and then you get depth equals two slice um and we spoke about how that's done as well in the previous lecture um so the convolution happens across the depth of the input volume so the the here the key thing to know this depth of each filter equals the depth of input block or input volume because you are using the depth of the input volume and you're convolving with all of that. So it's a 3D convolution, right? So this is a 3D convolution or 3D filter. So you're kind of like convolving with the depth and then you get a matrix. And that matrix is this. 
But then you have k such matrices and that gives you a block or a tensor. Okay. So we discuss this, hopefully this is clear. Um, and then you spoke about max pooling. So the difference between max pooling and convolution is max pooling preserves the depth. So you see the depth is preserved. Whereas in convolution, the depth depends on how many filters you're using uh, for, the, for the convolution layer. And we spoke about pooling as just a way to reduce the number of parameters or number of uh, neurons from the input layer to the output layer. So in this case, if you use um, uh, max pool with two by two filters and a stride of two, you get this, right? Um, and we spoke about, um, usually max pooling is non-overlapping uh, max pool, which means there is no overlap. So you have this, you have this, you have this, you have this. But if you change the stride length, you can overlap, right? So for instance, if you have um, a max pool, so this example of this is a two by two filter with S equals two. A max pool with a two by two filter and S equals one, this is an example of overlapping, right? Because you would be overlapping. As you stride, you'll be overlapping. Okay. Um, let me call this one, two. All right. So, uh, pooling layer reduces the size of layers in CNN and hence can reduce the number of parameters. This may or may not be significant, depends on how many, uh, how big is your input block and output block, um, depends on that. Usually F equals to S equals to, this is like standard if you're using uh, pooling and it's non-overlapping uh, and it down samples each dimension by two. So even though you, you're you using a two by two, uh, it seems like you're reducing by a factor of two, but you have two dimensions. So you're actually down sampling each dimension by two. So your total down sample is gonna be by a factor of four. Um, and pooling depth doesn't change. So we spoke about this. Um, Pooling can be max or average, but max is really popular and has shown to be uh, working well in practice. Okay, so to understand max pooling better, um, just to make sure you, you got everything down, let's just do a quick in-class exercise to work on a max pooling uh, with F equals two and a stride length of one and a zero padding P equals zero. So notice here, this combination is an overlap, right? So we're looking at an overlapping max pool. And the question is, uh, what's the value of the second row, second column of the output block corresponding to the depth slice of four? So this is this input is corresponding to a depth slice of four. So you're taking the input, doing a max pool, and then whatever you get as the output is the depth slice of four, but you're looking at the second row and second column of that and asking what is that value? Okay, let's take a minute to look at this question. Okay, so hopefully you uh, found that sees the answer here, because if you're looking at the second row, so the first row is somewhere here, right? So all of this is the first row. This is all row equals one. The second row is starting here. And then you go here, this is second row, second column. And then you do a max of that, max of this block gives you phi. Does that make sense? So for any given row, you have to just kind of shift by, um, you know, just shift the block by that amount. And then for the column, it just traverse this way. And since we have a stride length of one, we are traversing one at a time. So that helps you go to the right block and then you pick out the max element there. And that, that is basically the max pool value at that row and that column at that depth slice. 
So here the depth size didn't matter because uh, we were we didn't have to look at a block and then identify the depth. We we're already given the matrix corresponding to that depth slice. We just have to kind of go from here to here, essentially. Okay. So hopefully this kind of clarifies a max pooling operation and how, because you would be you may not even be looking at this um, when you are looking at the CNN model in PyTorch. It's all happening for you. You just said. Okay, I need to use a max pool here and then it does it for you, but it's important to understand how exactly it's happening. Um, great. So we covered that. Uh, also, as a recap, we looked at uh, the comparison between CNN and neural networks. We said CNN is a special type of neural network. It's specialized to images um, and it, it does more intuitive feature engineering uh, as compared to a regular neural network because it uses convolutions. Um, and it works on a block with height, width, and depth as compared to neural networks where the layers are encoded as vectors. And we also spoke about the feed for neural network parameter space would be prohibitively large for images, whereas con nets have shared parameter space. They have locally connected layers. All of this makes it um, easier to uh, have a smaller dimensional convolutional neural nets and keep the parameter space manageable. Like if you had 10 layers of neural networks, 10 layers in a neural network versus 10 layer in a CNN, it would be different. You might actually have fewer parameters in CNN because most of the initial layers are just convolutions and they are locally connected. And so you kind of really save the space in the parameter space and it helps you avoid overfitting. It helps you train faster. Uh, so it also helps you evaluate or do inference faster. Um, okay, so that brings us to the next topic, uh, which is popular CNN architectures. So um, there has been an evolution on the architectures uh, starting from the very beginning. Uh, like, like at the very beginning, there was something called the LayNet and then kind of people, someone introduced it. So Jan Lekun, so you see the lay here, that's kind of the name showing up in LayNet is his name. Jan Lekun was kind of one of the fathers of uh, deep learning and he came up with LayNet in 1998. Although he suggested it would be a good uh, model to understand and learn deeper things about images, but we didn't have the compute resources at that time. Uh, we didn't have, you know, GPU computation and all of that. Uh, we didn't have cloud storage, uh, cloud computation. And so people didn't do much about it. It was just a proof of concept. Didn't really implement it uh, at a large scale. But uh, all the subsequent nets that have come up have built on lay nets, right? And we'll take a look at that. And uh, yeah, you see there's, there's this mention here of runner up winner, all of that. So this is all corresponding to a challenge. Um, and this is why competitions matter, right? So the competitions, like you also have a Kaggle competition. The idea is that the best model comes out of a competition. And so every year, starting with 2012, people have been submitting, making submissions to this challenge. Uh, and coming up with better models for image classification and other tasks. So we'll take a look at some of these uh, architectures. Yeah, you can see the number of parameters as well. So the lane had started with 60,000 parameters, which is nothing in today's, uh, you know, with today's computer resources, and especially nothing for a deep learning model, 60,000 is nothing. Uh, AlexNet had 60 million. Uh, ZFNet also had 60 million, GoogleNet had 4 million, and then VGGNet had 138 million and so on. So, um, so we'll talk about some of these, you know, uh, architectures and their parameter spaces as well. And yeah, there's, there's also a column on error rates. So you can see the error rate on uh, the image net data set has been going down through the years as well. So what is the ImageNet data set? It was a data set that was launched in 2009 by Fei Fei Li, who's again, another um, uh, popular or 
impactful computer scientist uh, who came up with a large scale and clean image data set for benchmarking. So at that time, there was no real good uh, benchmarking. It has 1,000 classes. Um, so you can predict from 1,000 different classes. Uh, it has 1.3 million training images, 50K validation, and 1 million test images. So this is kind of standard. So you only use the 1.3 million. You can validate on the 50K, but you get evaluated on the 1 million test images. So that's how you benchmark. So 1 million is huge. Uh, so so you, you have to use all the things like don't overfit, you know, all the, all the things we discussed, um, and also have, use good architecture. So that's where people have worked on coming up with better architectures. People have also used uh, data augmentation. So maybe I can augment to this data set with some other training images from other places. Uh, so when reporting results, people say, did you use augmentation or you did not use augmentation? So you can have, because if you used augmentation, you might actually do better and it's not apples to apples comparison, um, but you can use aug augmentation to do better as well. So the IL, SVRC uh, is a challenge on this ImageNet data set that Fei Fei Li came up with um, to improve classification accuracy uh, of models and produce really, you know, really high, because 1000 classes is a lot of classes. And we'll see some of these classes are also hard to differentiate for a human being, but that is where you're taking these models towards like real uh, near human recognition of images and classification of images. Uh, that's where these models have gotten to over the years. Uh, so ILSVRC, so it's a big acronym, stands for ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. So it makes sense. It's a challenge based on the ImageNet data set. And the metric that people have been using for benchmarking, like we have a metric on the Kaggle contest as well with the mini project. So it's been the, it's called the top K error rate. Uh, it's, it's very simple to define. Is any of the models top K results the correct label? So let's say um, your true label is, uh, let's say cat. And then your, uh, your models predictions is like dog, bear, cat, cow, uh, tiger. These are the top five results. Well, cat does show up. So in this case, you'd say, okay, I would, I would assign one to this. If the top five results did not have, you know, the true label, then I would assign a zero. And then I average that across all my test data set, and that gives me the top K metric. So if my top K is 90%, it means for 90% of the test set, the top five results returned by the model have one of them is the true label. So for k equals five, for k equals one, your top result has to be matched with the label. Okay, so you you don't have five chances to get it right. You only have one chance. So people have looked at both top one and top five error rate for comparing models and benchmarking models. So here you use top one and top five. So the current best top one accuracy is at 90%. It's called the COCA model. I think this came out in 2022. So people people started benchmarking 2012, 11. And you would think, okay, you started way back. Maybe you got it right in a couple of years. No, people have been making improvements in the past decade. So every couple of years, there is some, every year actually, there's, an, there's a challenge and people keep making improvements. So it's it's amazing how, you know, and, and they do use something that was done in the past. So let's say last year you you added these changes and this is the best model. You take that and then tweak that and then you come up with a better model the next year. So there's always improvement that's been happening over the years. And maybe it's tapering off right now. So 90% is pretty good accuracy for top one, which means you're always getting it right 90% um, of the time. Um, the top five accuracy is at 99%. So this makes sense, right? The top five is always going to be better than top one. Like no matter what model you're using, you're always going to do better because you have five chances to get it right. Like it just has to be one of the one of the five. Whereas top one, you have to have the top uh, the first one be the right label. 
So the top five accuracy, the current best is at 99%, which is pretty good. Um, so and it's called the Florence Co. Swim H model. Um, and then if you want to look at a model that performs well on both nine, nine, uh, top one and top five, that's the one of them is called the Meta Pseudo Labels, which I think came up came out in 2019. Uh, it performs well on both top one and top five accuracy. So anyway, um, so that's like kind of like a introduction to the image net data set and the ILS VRC challenge. And a lot of what we're going to be talking today pertains to this challenge, right? Um, so let's look at the top K accuracy metric and understand it better through this in-class exercise. So say you trained your favorite CNN model based on one of these architectures, let's say VGG net or something. And by the way, you have to use one of these nets, right, for your uh, mini project when it gets, comes to CNN. Maybe use VGG net. Actually, it has a lot of parameters, but maybe use Inception. Like just see which are uh, you know you want to experiment with. Um, and your model predicts the top five results for each of the following examples as follows. So this is a true label, and this is your top five predictions. Um, and so the question is, what's the top one and top five accuracy scores averaged over these five examples? Okay. So maybe take a minute to you basically want to say it's one zero one zero one zero for top one top five and then average that to get this metric okay so hopefully you got uh, d as your answer um so top one is easy because you just have to look at the top and then see where do you match so you only match for this and this right so that's two out of five that's 40 percent and for top five, you have to see, um, do you match in any of the five? So you match here, uh, you match here, you match here, you don't match here, and then you match here. Okay. So, you're, you're, you're. so that gives you 80%. So you can see, even in the small example, uh, the top one accuracy is just is half of the top five accuracy. So top five accuracy is usually higher for that reason, because you can match in any of the five. Okay. All right. So uh, this is the evolution of the top one uh, over the years. So like we said, we started in 2013. So there was LaneNet before but there was no ILSVRC challenge at that time. But then AlexNet is based on LayNet, uh, kind of expanded it out. So that's where this was a winner for the 2013 challenge. And you can see they were at, um, I don't know, 60, was it 65%. And then there was, uh, I think, VGG here. And there was also uh, there's some, some other net, I forgot. ZFNet, yeah. So ZFNet is here. So it's it's still around the same, but then VGG gave you 75%. So that's a big bump. And this is 2000, like, this is still 2014, actually. It's a runner up for the 2014 challenge. Um, then you had Inception, 2016, Inception V3, that's at 80%. Uh, then you had ResNets come up, still at 80%. Then this ResNext. 85% and then there's this meta pseudo labels that we spoke about earlier that's hitting at 90% and then coca is at 90%. So you can see from 2013 through 2022 people have come up with newer and newer architectures and use the top one and top five metrics and they've gone from 65% all the way to 90%. Um, so it's kind of going to taper out, right? Like if you had 2023 ILS VRC challenge, like you might go from 90 to 91 or maybe even 90.5 because the, the gains are going to kind of taper out as you're getting better and better. Um, so you might not see much improvement, but people might still have the challenge to see if they can make improvements, incremental improvements here or there. And if you look at top five, like we said, the top five accuracy is always better than a top one accuracy. So even for AlexNet, we saw top one was 65%. 
and Alex and I at top five starts at 85 percent because it's a higher uh, you always get a higher metric on that high value on that metric uh, so we started 85 percent in 2013 and I think most of the evolution happened uh, from here to here for the top five because that 2016 inception v3 is giving us 95 percent so you already jump 95 percent from just in 2016 you're already there but from there um through florence here is at 99 percent so there's still been improvement from 95 to 99 percent that's a that's an improvement uh and so again you see inception res next and there's a some other model called florence course image okay But for top one, you do see a big improvement from 2016 at 80%. So 80 to 90 is actually a big jump. So even though top five hasn't changed much, like 95 to 99, top one, which is a more difficult uh, metric to improve, has actually improved significantly from 2016 to 2022. So again, the metric at which you look at does matter and tells you uh, how much improvement is actually happening. So in this case, top one is an important metric and you have made quite a bit of improvement from 2016 to 2022 through these models. Okay. All right. Um, so let's go back to look at some of these architectures, right? So we have AlexNet, ZFNet, GoogleNet, VGGNet. So we look at these guys today and we'll, we'll look at ResNet in the next lecture. Okay. So LayNet. LayNet is like 1999. Uh, Jan Lecon came up with this architecture. It's, it's different from, let's say, uh, a feed for neural network. And you can see there's an input image. Here, here there's a convolution filter. There is uh, Subsampling, so you can say the subsampling is like max pool or average pool. I think Jan Lecun suggested average pooling, but the idea of subsampling was already there. And then again, convolution, subsampling, convolution, and then this is your fully connected layer, FC. But there's only one of them here, and there's only like one, two, three. So there's three convolutions uh, and then one FC. So that's the simple LayNet. Okay. Uh, so we we even I, I don't know what the result is on this uh, on the ILS VRC challenge for lay, uh, LayNet, but it wouldn't be impressive for sure because it's not a deep network. Uh, but the idea of using convolutions, max pooling, everything started here with LayNet. Okay. So let's look at AlexNet. So this is the 2013. ILS VRC winner, and this is uh, this is a modification of LayNet, uh, but it it is more deeper and it has like everything is a little bit more right. So you have a con layer here, uh, you have a con layer here, here, and then you have like two or three FCs. So you increase the number of convolutions. You also increase the depth of convolutions. Uh, you also added a few more FCs. So it's an expanded version, you can say, of LayNet. Um, and it also incorporates ReLU. So ReLU was missing in uh, the LayNet. So that's a new addition using nonlinearity uh, through ReLU. And it also has deeper layers in LayNet. And it was developed to measure, uh, the, the original motivation for LXNet was to measure lateral distance between vehicles in an image. So if you have Im Vehicles in a major, you want to see what's the spacing between them. Um, and this is incredibly useful right now for, let's say, self-driving car. A self-driving car needs to know what's the distance between vehicles, where are the vehicles situated, and all of that from just an image or a video. Okay. And then we have ZFNet. ZFNet is, uh, I think, the, was it 2013? Um, let's look at it. ZFNet is, oh, Alex is actually 2012, sorry. So this is 2012. And then ZFNet is for 2013 winner, right? 
So the winner of the challenge for 2013 ILS VRC challenge took the model from 2012 and did some hyperparameter tweaking, right? So change some of the hyperparameters, really optimize for it, so you, and uh, make some small changes in the structure. So you can see some of these layers. They look the same as in AlexNet. You can see there's three FCs here, there's other three FCs here, but the number of neurons have changed. So it's 4096. Um, looks different here. 256. Uh, yeah. So maybe it's it's actually not different because here we are partitioning into two. So 2048, 2048 gives you 4096. Um, yeah. Let's see if the other layers look different. 192. Yeah. Some of these layers look different. Okay. So some of these layers look a little bit different. Uh, there's also hyperparameter tuning uh, tweaks that have happened, and anything else? One ten. Yeah, this makes sense. Okay, so mainly it's hyperparameter tuning that's happened between uh, AlexNet and ZFNet. So you haven't really changed the structure of the architecture, but you've just uh, optimized for you know, the hyperparameters. The number of parameters is the same as AlexNet, and this makes sense because you haven't changed the structure. So why would the number of parameters change? You haven't added more layers. You haven't, uh, you know, changed the number of, uh, you haven't changed the depth. So you have the same number of parameters. So one thing I want to uh, have you guys notice here is how does the 60 million show up? You can actually do the computation right here, right now, just looking at this layer, right? So like we spoke about earlier, these layers are not giving us a lot of parameters, right? Uh, the filters between these layers. So let's look at, for instance, uh, this one. So here you're using a filter size of seven and a stride length of two. Okay, so that's seven by seven by, uh, what's the depth? The depth is what you're getting here, right? So seven by seven by one, uh, sorry, the depth is um, the depth of this image. So seven by seven by three times 110. This is what, like a few thousand parameters? That's it. It's not in millions. Okay, let's look at a different one. Maybe look between layer two and layer three. Um, so here, after doing this max pooling, you're using a three by three filter with a stride length of one. Uh, so that's three by three, and then the depth is 256. Oh, sorry, the depth is 384 because you're going from 256 to 384 times 384. Uh, oops, it's not the right one. Uh, I need to use the same depth as the input here, so 256, but then I use 384 filters, so that's K, right? So what is this on the order of? Um, Is it, yeah, maybe, are we hitting 1 million here? 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, right? So we're, we're only hitting 10 to the 5. So we're not even hitting million here, right? Am I right? 10, yeah, something like that. Uh, we might be actually. Okay, so it's somewhere between 10 to the 5 and a million, but it's still not tens of millions of parameters, okay? So still less than 1 million. I would say, right? Okay, now let's look at this layer. So this is the important layer. So here you're going from a con to a FC. This is a fully connected, uh, right? So now what we're doing is you're taking this layer. Um, it has 250, so let's look at this. 256 uh, by six by six, right? So this is the depth. And then six by six is your so your your layer itself has a six by six. So you've reduced it from one ten by one ten to six by six. As you've gone through these layers, the size of the image has really shrunk. Times four thousand ninety six because you have four thousand. So if you're doing fully connected layers here, you get this. Um, what is this on the order of anyone? So 
7 times 4, something like 28, right? 28 or 30 million. So you see the most significant bump in the number of parameters is coming at the very end of the con net. And then this is 4 by 4, so that's 16 million. And this is 4 million because this the number of classes here is 1,000, right? So 4 by 1 is 4, so that gives you 4 million. So if you just add it up, uh, let's do a number of parameters. So, so you get a you know 1 million or change from the earlier layers, plus you get a massive 30 million from going from the con layer to the fully connected layer, the first, uh, so the, the first uh, dense layer here, plus you have 16 million, plus uh, 4 million. So this is what, 20, 30, 50, 51. So a little bit more than 51, so about 60 million. So you see, even just doing some ballpark computation, you're able to get close to uh, the actual number of parameters in, in a, so this is how even if you were to look at an architecture and you want to understand how many parameters are there, you can just go through these computations and figure it out yourself. Um, so you get like 60 million parameters. So what did ZFNet do? Well, it tweaked AlexNet on the hyperparameters and the accuracy went from 84.6 to 85.3. Not a significant bump, but it was a 2013 winner of the challenge. Okay, then came VGGNet. Okay, so this looks more involved. Uh, essentially, again, an expansion. So this is an expansion on uh, AlexNet or ZFNet. And where is the expansion happening? You can see the expansion is happening here or here. So you add uh, you, or let's say you stack con layers before max pool. So instead of having one con layer and then a max pool and then a con layer and a max pool, you add three con layers. So that's essentially what VGGNet has done, uh, right? And then you have three fully connected layers at the end. So this is the same. The difference is you have one, two, three, four, five. You have five layers where each layer, or sorry, five filters, where each filter has three convolution layers before doing a pool. So it's a it's an expansion of, you can say it's an X, you kind of take the LexNet and expand it out by adding more con layers in between. Uh, that's essentially what the structure looks like for VGGNet. But doing that actually makes a big difference. So you see the top five accuracy for VGGNet a jump from 85.3% to 92%. So that's a that's a significant bump. Uh, it was a runner-up in the 2014 competition, so it's not the winner. And obviously, if you're doing so many expansions, and especially in this, you know, here probably have a lot of parameters, uh, the number of parameters went up to 140 million from 60 million for ZFNet. So, and these days, even though VGGNet came up in 2014, People have been using it for image embeddings and representations. So it's still been quite useful in 2022, uh, the VGG net. And you can use it for your um, mini project if you like, although it, it, it is prone to overfitting. So you have to take care of that and it might take more time to train as well. So it's prone to overfit and op for obvious reasons, you have increased the number of parameters. Um, so there's more reasons to overfit. The applications that VGGNet have been put up to is like some of them, uh, fingerprint bi biometric authentication, crack detection, object tracking, and so on. Right. Um, so we want to be really highly go through airports these days, you have Clear. Clear is doing uh, face recognition really well. Um, so, you know, I, I wonder what model they use there, uh, if they're using any deep learning there. But like, if you have really complicated face recognition, biometric authentication, uh, things like that, you might be using one of these nets in there. 
Okay, so that was VGG net. Um, it was more than just hyperparameter tuning. It actually expanded out the LX net and, and it increased the number of parameter space. Um, let's also go to the uh, other, so that was a runner up. So VGG net was the uh, runner up for the 2014 ILS BRC. So then who was the winner? Well, the winner was Inception or Google Net. So this was the winner for 2014 ILS VRC. Challenge and um, the motivation for Inception or Google Net was this one. So a couple of the classes in the thousand classes that ImageNet has was the Siberian Husky and Eskimo Dog. Like even to a human, these look the same, right? If you looked at these two images, you might say, ah, I think both of them look like Husky, but actually ImageNet says they are different classes. So one is a Siberian Husky and one is an Eskimo dog. So you want to differentiate images into classes at this level of refinement. So if you want to get the 95% or 99%, then you have to be able to differentiate it at this level of refinement, which is not easy even for a human. So you're, you're asking to get near human accuracy for, uh, for image classification. Uh, so that's the motivation for Inception or Google Net. Uh, they wanted to do, really get there, and they were the winner of the 2014 ILS VRC challenge. And the Google Net looks like this, really fancy, really crazy. I mean, they, it's it's you know a fully expanded version of uh, AlexNet, but but with a lot of it has some new things in there as well. So it's not just expansion like VGG Net. They also did something new. Uh, which we'll talk about shortly. So there is convolution, Mac pooling, softmax, and there's also, uh, well, there's also inception. So there's something called an inception module. So they also use that. So the top five accuracy, um, actually, VGGNet came up in the same year. So I would say same thing, 85.3%, uh, yeah. Yeah, so 85.3% of ZFNet. So there was a big bump in 2014 from 85.3% uh, from the previous year to 94.4% for the top five accuracy. So that was a huge bump. Um, I mean, VGGNet also had a bump, 92%. So they introduced the inception module, which is new in the architecture. So there was convolution, there's this, but there's also the inception module. It has many more layers in LX and ZFNet. It has 22 layers deep, so you can see like you look at the number of layers, um, 22 layers. That's a lot of layers. Um, but surprisingly, even for so many layers and such a complicated architecture, number of parameters is 4 million, which is down from 60 million of ZFNet. So how did they do that? Well, the number of layers does matter for number of parameters, but also the depth of the layer does make a difference. So if you're smart about using a smaller depth, you can get away with having fewer parameters. So they only have 4 million parameters, which is uh, less than ZFNet and which is definitely less than VGGNet, right? Um, so the inception module looks like this, okay? Uh, so what is inception module doing? So inception is kind of a filter, like you can say it's a, a complex con filter. So you have the previous layer. What do you do? You actually apply different le levels of convolutions to the previous layer. So you do a one by one convolution, three by three convolution, five by five convolution. You also do max pooling. And then you get something out of all of these convolutions, right? You get this kind of a block. You get something like this. OK, and what do you do? You actually take all of these and then concat. So essentially, so you basically put them together. Um, so you have something coming from one by one, you have something coming from three by three, you have something coming from five by five, max pool. So instead of just saying do a three by three convolution on your input block and get this result, the inception module is able to combine 
convolutions at different levels of granularity, different scaling, and give it to the model. And the model says, okay, you've given me different uh, kinds of, you've, you've done different kinds of convolutions. I will, I will use whatever information that makes sense to me. So you're giving the model more of a choice uh, to be looking at the input at different scales. So that's a key change, key shift from the previous model is instead of fixing the size of the convolution, you give it different options. And that's what the inception module does. Um, and lets the model use information from all the scales. And there's also in inception model with dimensionality reduction. So this is a little bit of a refinement is if you look at the convolution, this is a 3D convolution, right? So if you did a five by five 3D convolution, it's like five by five times the depth. So it's, you know, 25 times more expensive than a one by one convolution. So instead in the, in the dimensionality reduction, what they do is they all, they do one by one convolution for, you know, to begin with. So that makes it faster. And then they do a three by three convolution on the image instead of using the depth. So you actually save space. Uh, save the, you save uh, you save in the number of parameters used for the inception module, and then you do the filter concatenation just like here, right? So this is the inception module um, that got used here. I think it's all of these. So for instance, if you look at uh, hmm. maybe we should take a look at this. This is not very clear here, but we can take a look at it. Um, on the website. So let me just stop sharing this one. Okay, let's go to the web page. Um, All right, so this is the paper on the inception model. You can see it's in 2014. This was the winner of the ILS VRC challenge. It's called Going Deeper with Convolution. So, you know, obviously all the authors are from Google because it's a uh, Google net or inception uh, that came from Google. So, uh, so we saw the motivation for this. Uh, let's look at, this is the inception module. We spoke about that. Okay, so this is like the Google net with all the bells and whistles. So you start here with the input, you do a convolution, you do a max pool, do some normalization, convolution, convolution, normalization, max pool. But now you have this inception module here. So you, do you see this, this region, this, these four things that you're concatenating? So that's one inception module. Um, and this is an inception module with um, dimensionality reduction because they're not using a three by three right away. They are using a one by one convolution and then using a three by three. So that's a dimensionality reduction here. And then you do a concatenation of the depth across the depth and then again go through this. And I think there's a bunch of these. So the interesting thing here is they, they, they mentioned in the paper that they don't use inception module right away. They use regular convolutions, but then after maybe three or four layers, they start using inception modules, and that seems to have worked better for them in practice. Um, also, something funny that's happening here is the the softmax, which is used to get, get the probabilities across the classes, is happening at different different depths of this network. So it's happening at the very end, which makes sense, but it's also happening a few layers before the end. It's all again happening a few layers before. So it's like you want to return a result early on, even before you have gone through the whole network, you, you have that option. So maybe you want to get like you have low latency or something and you want to quickly output a class. This allows you to do that because you, you can return a result much earlier. It may not be as accurate. Maybe the most accurate one is right here at the very end, but you can also do that a little bit earlier. Um, so anyway, uh, 
it's just a you can just think of this i mean it looks really complicated but it's a lot of repetition so you just have multiple layers of inception modules um in this right so i just want to share that okay okay so let's go back Okay. Um, yeah. So, if you want to take a look at a breakdown of the inception mo inception um, model or the Google Net, it looks like this. So, convolution max pool, convolution max pool, inception, inception. So, this makes sense, right? So, the inception starts here, and then you kind of keep going through all the way, um, and this is kind of where your convolution layers end. Then you have average pool. Interesting, they use average pool at the very end. Um, and then you have dropout, and then you have a linear uh, layer, and then you have softmax. Um, so this is interesting. You know, if you if you look at uh, models, a lot of models have this kind of a setup where the linear layer is not giving you probability, but you use the linear layer uh, or the last layer to give, to get probability through the softmax. So we spoke about that. And here the dimensions have to match. So you have 1,000 classes in the last layer. So you want to output 1,000 probabilities. So the layer before that one will have 1,000 floats. You're going to take that 1,000 floats and pass it through softmax. We spoke about it last time. So it's e to the negative z i divided by the sum of that. So you're kind of exponentiating it and then taking a, taking a, a dividing, normalizing it, and then you get a probability. So this like this makes sense and then you have dropouts here and you can see the number of parameters as well um let's look at yeah some of these inception layers do have a lot of parameters um and that's because of the depth they they use a high depth 1024 so you're getting about 1 million parameters here um so all of these add to four million parameters so so you take all of these parameters sum it up you get four million okay and the number of parameters let's say an inception module like you can see clearly how con concatenation works uh if you look at the inception module you have a one by one you have a three by three you have five by five and then a max pool right And then you concatenate it. So let's look at one of these. So let's say inception 3B. So one by one gives you 128, three by three gives you 192, five by five gives you 96, and the max pooling gives you 64. So if I add these numbers up, I get 380K, right? Maybe we, someone can verify that this is true. 128 plus 192 plus 96 plus 64. Does that give you 380K? 380? Yeah. Okay, so that's that's how you know the math works out is you're just concatenating the output depths and you get a depth of uh, uh, 380. Sorry, this is not 380. Uh, this is 480. Should be 480. Does that make sense? The sum is 480. Okay, so the same thing for any of these other ones. So let's say I take 256, 320, 128, and 128. That should give me 832. All right, so um, that's uh, inception model. We kind of walked through it as well. And this was one of the first models that gave a really high bump on the top five accuracy, like which you know went to 92%. Um, and I think the top one accuracy also. We should take a look at the top one accuracy. Um, yeah. Well, actually, top one still is at 80%. Top five was a 95. Okay, so top, yeah, so it, it did improve the top five accuracy from 85 to 95. Um, but the top one still had a way to go from here, because it was still at 80%. But it was a significant bump. It was not like ZFnet that was making incremental improvement. It did have 
a big improvement in the top phi accuracy. Um, so that's Google Net. Um, so in the next lecture, we'll kind of look at ResNet and ResNext uh, as some of the top models in uh, for CNN. So we'll look at a couple of more, a little bit more into the intuition. For your model, like um, in pre-training, what we do is we uh, tune the last but one layer uh, of an already trained model, and then add a few more layers to it, and then that that becomes your final model. So, if you really want to understand any of these nets, implement it yourself, or use one of the one of the implementations that's available on the net, um, and you get a deeper understanding of what's going on. Okay. So I think that's it for today. Um, I'll stop here to see if you have any questions on any of the material we have covered so far. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so we'll see you again next Tuesday. So I think next Tuesday we'll probably